Okay, so my first question. Um, marketers like to talk about uh, the skeptical new consumer uh, that is resistant to ad advertising. Is this really a new phenomenon? Uh, no, I don't think it's a new phenomenon at all. It's definitely one of the things that people say when they look at so what's changed. Clearly the last you know, five, ten years, there's been a lot of change because of technology and so on. So what is the nature of that change? And this is one of the conclusions that people come to. Uh, my view is that that's, there's nothing new about people complaining about, we've all, as long as there's been advertising, there's been people complaining about advertising, making fun of advertising, and being skeptical of advertising. And uh, for as long as that's happened, there's been advertisers complaining about consumers not doing what they want them to do. So certainly what I argue in the book is that something close to the opposite has happened in some ways where um, marketing and advertising hasn't become less pervasive, it's become much more pervasive. And on the consumer side, uh, what I argue is that actually people are, while they may um, be annoyed by a particular 30 second commercial, uh, there's a lot of evidence that on the brand level they're more willing to sort of embrace and project onto brands more meaning and more uh, importance than probably ever before. Mm -hmm. Second question. Um, we've moved from marketing to uh, murky marketing, or as you call it, marketing. Mm -hmm. How did this happen? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think that the Big Bang was the uh, sort of introduction of TiVo onto the consciousness. Not even the, necessarily the introduction of it into homes, because it's still even now, I think, in less than a quarter of American homes, DVRs in general. Uh, but when, when the idea even of TiVo first surfaced, many onlookers said, well, my God, this is, the end of, this is the end of advertising, this is the end of network television, and what a hugely empowering thing for consumers. Mm -hmm. But the unintended consequence, I suppose, is that um, it also, in my view, was a very empowering thing for the commercial persuasion industry. And by that I mean that it, it forced the industry to figure out new ways to get brand messages out there. Um, they certainly weren't going to react to this by just calling up their clients and saying, game over, we can't do anything for you anymore because all we know how to do is make 30 second commercials so you can now go out of business. Um, instead, they figured out, you know, it covers a range of things from product placement or just integration of brands into the show, so you can't really TiVo it out. Um, I talk in the book about, uh, as an example, um, Axe, the um, deodorant and body spray brand that actually there was a, a television show that um, called Game Killers that was actually sort of a result of their, of their creative, came right out of the creative brief and became its own show on MTV. You can't really TiVo that out. Axe is also an interesting example of one that went what they now call media agnostic, meaning they used every single medium available from small parties to traditional advertising to um, creating online games that became very popular to creating um, a sort of phony girl group that they put a YouTube video up and which is last time I looked at over 2.5 million views. So you can hardly say that the result was um, the snuffing out of ad imagery in our life, it just became, the line became more murky between what's commercial persuasion, what's entertainment, what's everyday life, and that's why I use the term mm -hmm. murkening. Okay, so in buying in, uh, you talk about the blurring of lines between marketing and the culture, um, mm -hmm. and the, the various forms of dialogue between brands and consumers. How do you see this dialogue evolving in the near future? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think that it, it's always sort of unknowable how this will play out, but to me, for a few years now, um, the trend has been toward, and this is kind of the flip side of the, of the marketing, or when I use the word marketing, I'm also talking about consumer behavior. So one of the fascinating things to me when I started working on this that I did not anticipate was, um, of course I went looking to sort of, to talk to younger consumers, specifically to try to figure out the answer to the question you're asking, which is, well, what does the future hold? Just on the theory that, well, young people are, you know, literally the future. So, yeah. um, and one of the things that surprised me was finding a lot of very smart and savvy young people who did live up to the stereotype of being kind of resistant to mainstream brands and mass brands and so on. 
But what was more interesting was that the way that some of these people were responding to it was actually by creating brands of their own. Um, a couple of examples in the book are some small brands called the Barking Irons and the Hundreds, mm -hmm. um, which really a, a true premise of what both of them are doing is that branding is in effect a form of culture and it is a, a legitimate way to express a point of view about the world and about how to live. Um, and these are smart, really smart, young, ambitious people who, um, like with the hundreds, you know, they're the kind of guys who it seems like they would start a rock band, but instead of starting a band, they started a brand. Uh, the Barking Irons have this really interesting point of view about sort of old New York and, and, um, and a lot of ideas about that and a lot of research into it that you would think might result in a book, but instead it's become a, a, a line of t-shirts and other um, apparel. So um, there may be something in that about where we're headed. I also talk in the book about the DIY craft movement a lot, which has some commonality with this in that it's, an embra it's, it's making a statement about material culture, but not by rejecting it, but by kind of embracing it, uh, but embracing it in a way that uh, a lot of people who are participating in it hope will change. They hope will change the conversation, change the dialogue. And my view is that that's a pretty interesting movement, and that, and that there actually could be some hopeful uh, aspects to that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you say that successful brands have a placebo effect on, on consumers. Now we are in the business of helping brands position themselves in in the marketplace. Uh, what should we keep in mind uh, when we consult our clients? About the placebo effect? <laughs> well, I'm citing their research d that um, was done on, uh, specifically they had someone looking at um, energy drinks and, uh, and the pricing of energy drinks in particular. So it was kind of the, the, the placebo effect sort of squared in the sense that they had them doing puzzles and different groups of people doing puzzles. And the group that, one group was given the energy drink um, with some branding materials and told it was two dollars. Another group was given it and told that it was it normally cost two dollars but the university gets it at a discount so it was one dollar I think. And this research is Dan Ariely who's got a book also called Predictably Irrational. It's very good. Um, and the fascinating thing was that the one who was told that it got two, that, it, that, the, that the drink cost two dollars really outperformed. Um, outperformed what a normal person was doing and outperformed what the low price, the low price group actually underperformed the norm. So there's clearly something in there, what Ariely's group said was you really do get what you pay for, which is pretty interesting. Um, now in terms of what you tell, what you tell your clients about all this, um, you know, I think that there are two answers to that. One is that you could tell them about this and say, um, here are seven ways to exploit this uh, human foible. Or two, you could say, nevertheless, that would be dishonest to exploit that human foible. Um, I would advise you to uh, 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 take the latter course. Um, one could argue that the reason to take the latter course is that eventually you'd be found out and exposed and it would boomerang on the brand and it would look bad, possibly. Um, I would argue that the better reason not to try to exploit the placebo effect would be um, so you can sleep at night. And that leads to the question about social responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, is social responsibility yet another flavor uh, in the current yeah. dialogue between our brands and our identities? Yeah, I mean, it's a really confusing time for that stuff. And firms like yours are actually in a tough position, or, or marketing firms, because um, you can't tell your clients what to do. And I'm certain that your clients um, are aware that, well, there's a lot of interest in these issues right now and we need to respond to that in some way. And what I've observed is that the way that a lot of um, companies are responding to this shift or this rise of interest or however you want to position it is, is tending to say, well, let's start a niche line that speaks to that niche of the market um, and keep our main and not really make any fundamental changes in the things that we're doing uh, over here in our main business and that way we get the best of both worlds so we get the consumers who do care and we get the consumers who don't care. Um, that's not a very exciting development to me and I uh, think that it would be much more exciting to say like you know uh, let's just change our product uh, across the board. 
There's an interesting example that's not in the book, but that I think is potentially compelling of um, Nike, actually, or Air Jordan, the new, the new Air Force, I mean, the new, the new Air Jordan was made using some of the same principles of their, this considered project that they had done, which had evolved through a, uh, a firm called Staple in New York that was very um, sustainability oriented. And to see that get integrated into um, a huge flagship product like that is to me more interesting and more exciting than to see yet another niche spin-off that speaks to these consumers and just sort of the idea that, well, we'll wait and see how that does in the marketplace and then decide. And we'll see what Walmart does, right? Yeah, well, you always have to see what Walmart does. <laughs>